Open your Bibles, please, and we'll be studying what's not found in the Bible. <laughs> it is uh, something about the so-called Jehovah's Witness group. I say we're not studying a whole lineup of it, but we're going to look at what I have pointed out all along, and I must realize that my own life, the study of the Bible, or approaching any religion, or examining anything, whether it's myself or anything else purported to be from God, that is, what is the final authority? What is the final authority in determining right and wrong? Well, we have no problem in the Lord's church, we're faithful at all, in understanding that Christ put his authority in the words of his last will and testament. And there is the final say-so of the will of God for us on earth because he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Jesus declared before he went back to heaven that all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. And on that basis, we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We're to teach the truth. But when you approach certain groups, then you'll find that... Uh, they don't have the New Testament as the final rule of faith and practice in determining right and wrong. Now you will notice when you're dealing with those who call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses that they have the Bible and Tract Society known as the Watchtower Organization. They used to be in Brooklyn, New York a good many years ago. They moved upstate. And the reason that I point that out is that uh, there is a governing board. A governing board doesn't just, like a corporate board, oversee a corporation's work, but is the governing board of the Jehovah's Witness group. And here's what they say of their position. This is uh, a quote, and I have the address here from them off of the Internet. And in speaking of the duties of the governing body, they call it, they wrote this, and I'm quoting. In addition to its work through these committees, now just before this, it listed uh, five committees, I think, whereby they manage the whole thing, and there is one off of the governing board that sits on each one of these committees. But it says, in addition to its work through these committees, that is, the uh, governing board, the governing board meets each week to consider the needs of the organization. In these meetings, now watch closely or listen closely, in these meetings, the members of the board, the governing board, discuss what the scriptures say and they yield to the influence of God's Holy Spirit striving for unanimous decisions. Now they cite... Acts chapter 15 and verse 25 at the end of that quotation. Well, that's about the conference in Jerusalem, which was held to find out where the false teachers teaching that Gentiles must be circumcised to keep the law, where it all came from, where that doctrine came from. Because they had come from Jerusalem down to Antioch and began to teach it, and Paul and Barnabas had a, a great discussion there. So they determined to go to Jerusalem and they went up to Jerusalem and met with the church and the elders and the other apostles to find out where is this doctrine coming from. Now, Paul knew it was wrong, you remember, because he already debated them. He did not, as an apostle of Christ, have to wait till anybody told him because, as he said in Galatians, he received what he received of the gospel directly by revelation of Jesus Christ. And such was the case with all the apostles. So that was not a council in Jerusalem to determine God's will. If you read that and get that, then you didn't get what you ought to got. <laughs> it is not there to determine what is God's will on this business of the Gentiles and what must they keep of the law of Moses or not. It is to determine exactly who down there taught this thing. And you don't have to read far into Acts 15 to realize that it is the Pharisees. Verse 5 says, But rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. So they're Pharisees and obey the gospel. They're Christians. 
saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. That's pretty close to a proposition, precisely stated. They had no problem saying that's what we must teach the Gentiles once they've obeyed the gospel. They've got to do this. It's necessary if they're going to heaven. Now, they found out then where that was coming from, and they reinforced, if you read the whole chapter, they reinforced what was already the truth. We want to make sure they don't... Uh, uh, anywhere else where the church is, that they don't pick up on this because if they went from Jerusalem to Antioch to teach this, then guess what? They're going to be going somewhere else. And we know from Paul's writings through the rest of Acts even that the Judaizing teachers of the church gave him trouble uh, regarding his teaching of the truth as much as the unbelieving Jews and pagan Gentiles did. So this meeting was not at all about to say, well, let's learn the truth so we'll know what to teach. It was, let's find out who's teaching false doctrine, where it came from, and then we will reinforce the truth already spoken because Paul had already spoken at the Gentile church. So much so, and he was so convicted of it, he already debated the people that came from Jerusalem to teach this doctrine. So this is not a passage to quote to say, well, the Holy Spirit's going to guide us that we can have unanimity of decision as we study the Scriptures. But that tells us something about what they think. If you look at the Pope, and they'll criticize the Pope, by the way, and criticize the Catholic Church for simply saying, well, you've got to listen to us. We can tell you what the Bible says. You don't have any business independently looking at it. But they say the same thing here. Now, have you ever dealt with Jehovah's Witnesses, so called? You will find they will not take a track from you. Uh, they will hardly discuss anything unless they are in the position to control the discussion. Now, I just thrill with joy when they come by my house because I'm ready to discuss things with them because I know exactly what we're going to do. When I was a much younger person, I don't know why it's changed as I've gotten older. And I guess it's not coming by like they once did. But back in my 20s, I dealt with them all the time. And uh, one time they came out to a church where I was preaching in a country church in Arkansas. And so when they came up and they realized what was going on with me, they started leaving. I said, do you mind if I go with you? <laughs> I enjoyed that afternoon. And so we didn't get to but one more house, though, before they quit and went home. But I said, if you're going to go teach it, I'm going to be with you and expose your false teaching wherever you go, unless they run me off or you just won't go with me. They didn't know what to do about that. So uh, I spent the afternoon doing that. And I think what was so funny, I'll tell this, after, I think it was after Jody and I married, because it's somewhere in that area before and just after. We lived in an apartment in town, and this man I'd had the run-in with the most, a considerably older person at that time, at my stage of the game. And uh, one day the door, uh, sometime later, the, somebody knocked on the door, went down there, and it was him. He looked so bewildered when I answered the door. <laughs> But there's ways that you've got great opportunities that come right on your doorstep if you're willing to take them. And the point I would make with them, we will make this afternoon without covering all their various area, eras because they have many of them. Uh, we'll look at just one. And that is, where is their source of authority to determine what's right and wrong in God's sight? Or as they will always say, in Jehovah's sight. And by the way, when I'm dealing with them, even though they have the peculiar terminology, wherein that terminology is in harm to the Scriptures, I use their own terminology. If they want to call Jehovah God or God Jehovah, I'll be glad to do that. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. That's what he, what he is. According to the American Standard Version and other places, he's called Jehovah. It's really putting together an English pronunciation of the, uh, uh, of the Yahweh, which uh, Jews don't know how to pronounce, and it's even supplied with vowels. But anyway, I'll use what they can just to accommodate them. Be that as it may, notice they discuss what the Scriptures say and they yield to the influence of God's Holy Spirit striving for unanimous decision. How do they know they yield to it? They've got the Scriptures. They admit they're studying them with their own minds to figure out what they say, but there's something else in the mix. The Holy Spirit's there to guide them. That's the reason Jehovah's Witnesses, as I said in the beginning, will only follow what comes from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. It's because these men who are the governing body claim to be directed by God. So you've got the Pope and his councils all directed by God. You've got Pentecostals all being directed by whatever. But it all gets you away from the text of the Scriptures. Remember this. If Satan gets a person's soul, 
He must get them in some way or the other away from what the Bible actually says. Look at the very beginning. What did Satan do to Eve? She starts out saying, if you want to let God's word then be called the Bible, saying exactly what the Bible said. She ends up saying what Satan says, or believing it and obeying it. Now, who did that? Well, he did, Satan. But she had to yield to believing the lie. And that tells us why she did, because of the appetites of the flesh. Okay, we know, and this can't be emphasized enough to all of us, no matter how long you've been in the church, we're to prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, each one of us. We always say to people, no matter how much that preacher knows the Bible and how well he teaches it, you're supposed to be studying for yourself. They don't want you studying for yourself. And in that way, the Roman Catholics don't either. Because if you understand their hierarchy, they're not supposed to. The priest and the teaching arm of the church, the magisterium, are to tell you what the Bible says, if you need to know it. Then we learn from 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, the word that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's each one of us. We're to have our mind in the book. We're to honestly peruse it, rightly divide it, use it correctly. And we all know what was said in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, the Bereans, and these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, that they received the word with all readiness of mind. It doesn't say anything about and yielded to the influence of the Holy Spirit as they studied it. It just says, with all readiness of mind, and search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Now, these scriptures and others like them show the importance of individual concern and determination to study that Bible for yourself to know what God says. We're also taught as Jesus taught, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day, John 12, 48. So I want you to keep that in mind by way of introduction. And then we will look at some quotes from the literature. Now, one of the best things in the world is to have what they've written all the way back to when they started. And we could spend a lot of time on the history of them back into the 19th century. But a lot of that stuff is still very much available. One of them that came out, and I forgot exactly in what year, I have a copy of it. Millions now living will never die. We'll pull that on today and see what they think. And uh, that doesn't work very well with them. Back in the 1970s, early 70s, Brother B.C. Goodpasture, uh, 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 the editor at that time of the Gospel Advocate, reprinted that book and distributed it just so he could get in the hands of people to meet with Jehovah's Witnesses because everything it says in there did not happen. <laughs> and there are a number of things like that or else they've contradicted themselves. One time, and I'll share this with you, it just came to mind, we were studying with a group and I had a number of these kinds of quotes. Well, here was a quote that read one way and very plainly the other quote sometime later read right the opposite as to what the meaning were. And I just took them and had them read both those quotes out loud. And they, they graciously read them. And I said, uh, you've always taught right from the beginning. Which one of those is the truth? And they did all kinds of wiggling and tried to say, well, we've all grown and developed. I said, make a difference. And one of those is the truth, the other is not. Which one is it? I never could get them. To admit, and there it was. If they read one and then read the other, both contradicted the other. Well, consider, I assure you this is the way to do it, at least one great way to do it, is to have a body of literature from them going way back. Now, they think, for reasons I've already said, that the only way you can understand the Bible is through the Watchtower Organization. Listen to this quote. This goes back to 1973, Watchtower, July 1st, page 402. Only, and I'm quoting, only this organization functions for Jehovah's purpose and to his praise. 
To it alone, God's sacred word, the Bible, is not a sealed book. Well, if it's not a sealed book through their teaching, but it must be therefore a sealed book to everybody else that doesn't have their guiding hand. So this is an amazing quote. Only, in other words, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society and specifically the governing board can properly interpret the Bible. It's saying that the Lord Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, in his word, cannot give a Christian, a, anyone, a proper understanding of what the Bible teaches. But we're taught that the mind's opened with an honest and good heart, Luke 8, 15, by the simple study of God's word and handling it correct. Well, it's obvious they don't want, and this is a very important point, they don't want members of Jehovah's Witnesses to think independently. You should listen to what those who are attentive to the Holy Spirit's influence have concluded, and then they will tell you what's what. Individuals also are not able to rightly divide or interpret the Bible apart from the teaching of the Watchtower organization. Listen to this quote. October 1st, 1967, page 587 of the October Watchtower. Thus the Bible is an organizational book and belongs to the Christian congregation as an organization, not to individuals, regardless of how sincerely they may believe that they can interpret the Bible. What does that say to the individual members of Jehovah's Witness group concerning their independent individual study of the Bible? Well, you don't do that. You've got to have this consensus by the Spirit's guiding hand of the governing body as it, through the watchtower information, tells you what's what on the matter. And again, they will belittle the the Roman Catholic Church through its hierarchy telling the Catholics to listen to them. Here's what they said in Watchtower July 1st, 1943, page 201. Quote, the, Bi the Vatican belittles Bible study by claiming it is the only organization authorized and qualified to interpret the Bible. Well, we've learned from them <laughs> that they are the only ones. You ought to listen to them and not Pope and all of him, his, his views or his organization. If you don't understand something, here's their view of it. If you don't understand something, then meekly wait for the watchtower to tell you what the truth is. And if you don't, you're foolish. Here's the quote. We should eat and digest and assimilate what is set before us without shying away from parts of the food because it may not suit the fancy of our mental state. We should meekly go along with the Lord's theocratic organization and wait for further clarification rather than balk at the first mention of a thought unpalatable to us and proceed to quibble and mouth our criticisms and opinions as though they were worth more than the slave's provision of spiritual food. Now, this theocratic ones will appreciate the Lord's visible organization and not be so foolish as to put or put against Jehovah's channel their own human reasoning and sentiment and personal feelings. Watchtower, February 1st, 1952, page 79 through 80. Does that have a message that they're getting out to their people? If you don't like it, be patient and be sure you listen, listen for the official explanation that comes through the theocratic organization. Now, who's the top of that theocratic organization? The governing body. What do they do? We assemble once a week, study the scriptures, and we're ready to yield to the Holy Spirit so we can all be at one on it. I don't know what they do when two or three of them disagree and then somebody has to give up or whatever. Because remember, this is not optional matters where they're trying to figure out the best way to discharge an obligation. They're trying to figure out the Lord's will, what is obligatory. So somebody has to think, well, we, it means this. Somebody says, no, it means that. Somebody's got to give up what they think it means as they discuss this. 
And I guess they do because that's the Holy Spirit moving upon them directly to bring them to consensus. Again, notice how it keeps them away from their own personal study of the Bible. You're waiting to see what the governing body concludes because the Holy Spirit moved on that governing body to bring about this consensus, and then it's going to be written in this material produced by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. In effect, it's inspired. The Watchtower magazine, they teach, is the means of God's communication. Listen to this. 1939, Yearbook of Jehovah's Witnesses, page 85. It should be expected that the Lord would have a means of communication to his people on the earth. And he has clearly shown that the magazine called The Watchtower is used for that purpose. Well, I always thought you could pick up your Bible and in all honesty study it and learn the will of God without any addition, subtraction, or alteration. But not so. So this says that Jehovah's Witnesses organization is the very means God uses to communicate to people on earth today. Have you studied something recently on Wednesday night that completely contradicts this? You're studying Hebrews. God who had sundry times in divers' manners spake in time past of the fathers by the prophets. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by the governing body of the Watchtower Association. <laughs> That's exactly their position. But we know that it's Jesus Christ who has the final say. And the only place you find out what Jesus Christ taught is in his last will and testament, the New Testament of the Bible. And Jesus says it meant when it was given originally what it meant, what it means now, and what it means now, it'll mean on the day of judgment. And he said what he meant, he meant what he said. And it's not going to change. God, uh, they, they claim you cannot understand the Bible at all without the Watchtower organization itself. In the Watchtower, February 15, 1981, we all, and I'm quoting, we all need help to understand the Bible. And we cannot find the scriptural guidance we need outside the, quote, faithful and discreet, unquote, slave organization. <laughs> You've got to listen to us or you'll never know. That's what they're saying. So it sets itself up. Jehovah's Witness organization as the sole means of learning what the Bible really says. Now notice what it says about those who think apart from the Watchtower's guidance. Notice who he says they're like. I quote from Watchtower, August 15, 1981. Again, I say I quote. From time to time, there have arisen among the ranks of Jehovah's people those who, like the original Satan, have adopted an independent fault-finding attitude. They say it is sufficient to read the Bible exclusively, either alone or in small groups at home. But strangely, through such Bible reading, they have reverted right back to the apostate doctrines that commentaries by Christendom's clergy were teaching 100 years ago. If you read the Bible, and the Bible only, with an honest and good heart, wanting to know what God's will is for your life, it's simply going to take you into man-made doctrine. You have to have the infallible guiding hand of the Watchtower Society, or you simply can't do right what it comes down to and stay doing right it destroys individual initiative and in thinking you can read the Bible for yourself and learn the truth now they also will teach that if you love God you'll accept what the watchtower says I quote from October 1st 1967 page 591 of the watchtower we cannot claim to love God yet deny his word 
that stopped there. That sounds good right there if I stopped it. But they go on. And a channel of communication. Now, let's put it together in its whole. We cannot claim to love God, yet deny His Word, and channel of communication. Well, we've already learned what they think is the infallible channel of God's communication. And it's not the Bible by itself. It's the governing board determining by direct influence of the Holy Spirit just what the Bible teaches. Then they publish all that through their writings. One more. I've already given enough that I ought to knock in the head anybody that thinks they go by the Bible and the Bible only. The truth of God can be known, and we've already touched on this, through only through the Watchtower Organization. Let me read again. Watchtower, October the 1st, 1994, page 8. Quote, All who want to understand the Bible should appreciate that the, quote, greatly diversified wisdom of God, unquote, can become known only through Jehovah's channel of communication, the faithful and discreet slave. Thus, when they all get together once a week and they're pondering over the scriptures, but yet they're yielding to the movement of the Holy Spirit to bring them all into the agreement of what this says, then if you want to know what God says about the meaning of this verse, then they will put it out and tell you. Otherwise, sit there and be quiet. Now you say, oh, surely they're not like that way. Try to talk with one of them. I've done this. I've said, well, you're giving me your tracks. I'm glad to get it just to have it so I can see what you, what you believe. Now, wouldn't it be fair if you took what I have to offer? Oh, no. And they won't. So the only way you're going to be able to get to study with them is to have them come to your door and agree to study with them. You may get one study. <laughs> Uh, Mormons, sometimes I've gotten two, but it works about the same way. Now, notice, Mormons appeal to something other than the Bible, the Book of Mormon, more particularly the Pearl of Great Price and Doctrine and Covenants. Now, that's where their doctrines come from, but they all claim to be inspired. If the Mormons are right, what does that say about the Holy Spirit's work with his governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, or vice versa? Or then, the Roman Catholic Church and its Council of Synod and its teaching arms, which they claim, of course, comes directly from the Holy Spirit. Or then you've got people like the late Oral Roberts and all of these uh, characters. You know, he, he got the idea to build that hospital in Tulsa, so he told. But he woke up one night, Lord, standing at the end of the bed and told him to. Uh, direct communication. Brother G.K. Wallace used to say, and I think it was when Nixon was president, he'd say, Nixon has a hotline to Moscow and vice versa. Said these Pentecostal preachers have a hotline to God. They don't need the Bible. Truth of the matter is, you've got the Holy Spirit directly leading you. Why do you need a Bible? Why do you need a Bible? You don't. You've got God directly leading you. And if you're going on hunches and notions and feelings and whatever else, why depend on the Bible? If that's the way God lets you know what's right and wrong. So it's obvious then whether it's Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, as Brother Keeber used to say, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, he said, too late saints. Uh, that's, that's right. They've got a guidance that is beyond the Bible. And we'll probably look at some more, like Mary Baker Eddy, who also wrote Science and Health is Key to the Scriptures. That's how she gets around the Bible because she had an unction from God and what she wrote there will tell you what the Bible says. And it's that way everywhere you look. Some way or the other, Satan gets you away from the pure, unadulterated truth that's in the words of the Bible and makes you depend on something else. This just happens to be the so-called Jehovah's Witnesses. And let me quickly say this and we'll be through. Number one, this is rehashing. It's obvious they don't want the individual to study the Bible, period. Number two, when they say they're Jehovah's Witnesses, that's a misnomer. I'll, I many times will ask them, according to how the thing's going, say, what, what's, what's Jehovah like? And they look at me kind of funny. I said, you said you're his witness. I know the meaning of the word witness. What do you look like? What's he like? And they can't tell you. Of course they can. No man has seen God at any time. So that's a wrong thing to say. Jehovah's Witnesses, no. They'll go sometimes to 
pointing out in Matthew 24 that it says before the destruction of Jerusalem, which they interpret in that, misinterpret that to be the end of the world, and then the gospel have traveled all over the world for a witness. But I kindly remind them it doesn't say individual Jehovah's Witnesses of this organization are witnessing. It says what? The gospel is the witness. That's what's to be preached to every creature, Mark 16, verse 15. It's the gospel that's a witness. I can't give any testimony. You ever notice these folks want to give testimony? Let me tell you what God did for me. As Brother Foy used to say, they start patting right up here in the floor. You know what they're patting right here. Let me tell you what God did for me. They kind of move down the ladder a little bit. The point is, is that when you begin to use your testimony for what God did for you, you're canceling and making useless the true inspired testimony of the apostles. Now, who can give better testimony than the apostles of Jesus Christ? Nobody. You cannot, in view of the real, genuine definition of witness, have any kind of witness today. I can preach to you everything there is in this New Testament, and there's the evidence. John 20, 30 and 31. Brother Wallace used to say, if you want a miracle, I'll preach you one or I'll read you one. But it won't be one worked. And that's true. Miracle is uh, working apart from natural law. And that doesn't happen today. Miracle impresses people. That doesn't happen today. If somebody raised the dead, not to die anymore, <laughs> like the resurrection of Christ, I think I tend to want to pay attention to them. That hasn't happened. And the resurrection of Christ from the dead was the ultimate crowning miracle for he had to die no more. That Christ is who he is, the way, the truth, and the life, that no man cometh to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. And by him means by his will, John 12, 48. Well, this is just one way to deal with them, and if I were dealing with him, I would start here. But then you've got all sorts of other things that they teach that are wrong. But, of course, it won't be wrong to them because that body up there, their governing body, has determined <laughs> that what they teach is right. And the individuals study the Bible all they want to. And they cannot say it's wrong because they don't have what that channel gives them from the direct work of the Spirit they claim they have when they settle on what the Bible actually teaches. And through the writing of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, they tell people what's going on. If you're not a Christian, all you have to do to become a Christian is, first of all, you must have a humble, contrite heart and a teachable spirit. If you don't have that, there's no use going over the rest of it. Receive with meekness the engrafted or implanted word that you may grow thereby. So you can hear the word of God preached all day long. Paul could stand here and preach it. Wouldn't do you any good if you had to, you'd wrong. Same thing true of Jesus Christ. Jesus would stand here and teach you everything possible to be taught. But if you don't have the proper disposition toward Christ, you know what you'll do? You'll be yelling, crucify him, crucify him, like the rest of those that should have known better. So there must be a proper disposition of heart. It must be honest and good. Look at the scriptures and say, I'm going to do whatever this Bible says or sacrifice whatever is keeping me from obeying what I know the Bible says. And if you're going to say, well, God's going to save me anyway. I know I had this good feeling when I did it and it would have sinned. No, it won't work that way. It won't work that way at all. And we have the Bible where we can look into the perfect law of liberty and know what we believe and what we do is either right or wrong. In harmony with God, or not. So once you have the disposition of heart to be taught and will submit to his will and you learn his will, then faith is formed, Romans 10, 17. You'll do what Acts 17, 30 says and repent of your sins. You will obey Romans 10, 10, confess your faith in Christ, and then you will submit in the final act of becoming a Christian by being baptized in Christ for the remission of sins. Not baptized because you were saved back here at belief, but baptized for the remission of sins. To that end, not that only, but that's a culminating act in getting into Christ. We're in our all spiritual blessings, Galatians 3, 26, 27, Ephesians 1, 3. Now, if you've done that and you're a child of God, there's a second law of pardon. Repent of your sins, confess your sins, and pray God for forgiveness. Never dawn on anybody that when brethren come forward to make confession of fault, their repentance has to already be done. 
It just evidences repentance. So when one confesses sins, the repentance has already taken place, and you're evidencing that to those when you brought reproach on the church by the sin or sins you committed. So the repentance takes place, and the evidence of it is the confession of sin, and then all praying together for the forgiveness of sins. If you need to obey the gospel, be sure you do so today while you can as we stand and sing.